love that dopey every day I just can't wait for the next thing that Chris and Dave are gonna say But yes, it's dopey, I used to be a junkie But now I've got some hopey, cause of those dopes down at Dopey This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Aloe Recovery Located in sunny Southern California, in Malibu and Silver Lake Aloe was created by our friend Bob Forrest and his friends, Evan, Jared, and Bob, as a place for addicts to be treated with compassion and connection rather than control. They created a place that treats co-occurring mental health disorders, including severe mental illness, and they provide a detox so comfortable, uh, people say it's comfortable. That's how comfortable it is. And they have amenities like you wouldn't believe, including surfing, sound bath meditation, sweat lodge, and even equine therapy. Basically, if you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California to get help, I strongly recommend going to Aloe. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by Your Sober Buddy app. I'm so excited because the Sober Buddy app is now available. Many of you love the Sober Buddy daily emails, and this app takes it to the next level. Sober Buddy checks in on you every day to see how you're feeling and to give you tips and motivations based on your mood. The daily challenges shift and change based on how you interact with Buddy on the app, and it also keeps track of all of your challenges and lists. Plus, there's a super satisfying sober tracker with confetti explosions. Search Your Sober Buddy in the App Store. Again, it's Your Sober Buddy. I strongly encourage you guys to download the Your Sober Buddy app. Uh, It's another tool in the toolbox. It's another ally in your phone. If you need help, Sober Buddy could be that extra help you need. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by listeners like you in the Dopey Nation. Through the power of the Dopey Patreon page. It's www.patreon.com slash Dopey Podcast. We have 11 fucking free episodes available. And if you miss Ray on the show, this week on Dopey Patreon, Ray is back for the whole thing. And he is brilliant. Go to Dopey Patreon. Kick down a few bucks. If you do and you want a Dopey decal for your car, we'll ship it right off to you, wherever you may be. Dopey Patreon is a way to help me make Dopey. Uh, Kick down money if you want more Dopey. It makes the show better and easier to make. Also, we have ridiculously cool gear in the Dopey Podcast store. We have tote bags. The mugs just came in. We have super new cool tank tops, fucking crop tops, if that's a thing, and T-shirts and long sleeves and hoodies. And uh, they're all made by this company out of Cincinnati, which are a bunch of uh, recovering heroin addicts called SRO Prints. Buy from us, support them, and uh, enough with the fucking ads. Here is the show. And welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And I'm Dave, and I'm in like the 120 degree attic, putting the final touches on another week's episode of Dopey. And I love making Dopey. I want the show to be bigger than Joe Rogan, which is doubtful, but I want it to be bigger than Joe Rogan. So before we even start the show, I'm going to throw myself at your mercy because like, what the fuck? You guys know how much I like seeing Dopey on the charts. You know how much Chris loved reviews. You know, my father lives for the reviews. So I found out how we get Dopey bigger and you guys have to help. So this is what we have to do or what you have to do. If you care about Dopey, this is what you have to do. First, you search for Dopey on Apple Podcasts. Then you subscribe. Subscribe to Dopey on Apple Podcasts. Listen to something, rate the show five stars, leave a nice review, please, and then let people know the show exists, which a lot of you do. It's time to restart the Dopey Street Team. It's time to get this thing into the next gear. I know how much you guys love Dopey and the Dopey Nation. It's time to like put our money where our mouths is, our mouths is, or our mouths are. Put our money where our mouths are. That's a weird thing to say. Um, And we're going to start this process with, we talked about this like a year ago or a little less than a year ago, which is Dopey Day. And Dopey Day is inspired uh, from V for Vendetta, where all of the dudes put on the, um, 
the Guy Fox mask, and, and they were one unified being. So on Dopey Day, which will be the day that Chris died, which was on July 24th, two years ago. So on July 24th, it's a call to action for everybody who loves the show, who listens to the show, to change their profile picture on social media to have the Dopey logo across their eyes. And I will be participating, obviously, and I hope you guys will too. And, uh, and this is going to be the first major action of the newly formed, reformed, dopey, digital street team, which might actually be a real street team too. So if you guys are interested in participating in the dopey street team, be it digitally or in real life, just write me an email at dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Now, so I hope you guys are ready. There's big news. And if you remember last week, there was an email... Uh, saying that me and my family were the worst pet owners in history because I killed a bunch of crickets. Well, there's good news. First good news is that Flash the leopard gecko is eating. We got him new worms, and we bought him smaller crickets, and Flash seems like he's really uh, making a comeback. So if you were worried about Flash, you should be happy he's doing well. In other crazy animal news, Linda did it, and she got Nora a cat. It's a black cat. It's all black. We got it yesterday. I think it's 10 weeks old, and its name is Onyx, um, which I don't feel that good about. I mean, Onyx was an all right rap group in the mid-'90s whose most notable hit was, of course, Slam, Let the Boys Be Boys. But I wanted to call it Serious Black or Blackie in honor of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we have a black cat named Onyx. And uh, we will take good care of this cat. It is a beautiful cat, and we will love it and take good care of it if you are worried about us being terrible pet owners. In other news, uh, last week I also talked about my horrible habit of chewing paper towels, and I asked people to send in stories or habits they might have, and I heard from a couple people. And the first one's name is Mandy, and she says, Hi, Dave. I have a disgusting habit I want to share with you. I pick my feet, usually when I'm sitting on the couch watching the TV. When I was still using, I would pick them until they bled. It is kind of similar to peeling a string cheese. For some reason, I find it soothing. I'm a lot better about not making my feet bleed since I got clean and sober, but I do still really enjoy a good foot picking session. Ay, ay, ay. My husband gets really irritated when I pick my feet, and he will grab my hand and hold it to try to make me stop. I pick the skin off my foot and throw it on the floor next to the couch. Then my dog Pete gets down there and eats it so I don't have to clean it up. It's the circle of life. Hope this finds you well and less ashamed about your paper towel and chew- paper towel chewing habit. Stay strong, Dopey Nation, and toodles for Chris. I love that. Thank you, Mandy. I appreciate it. And uh, I got another one. This is from somebody called Bon Bon. And she says, here is the most disgusting bad habit. Instead of clipping my toenails, I pull or pick them off when they get long and chew them. I've done it since I was a kid. I try not to in the summer because I like to have cute painted summer toes. But in the winter, game on. Thank you, Bon Bon. And thank you, Mandy. And if you have any disgusting habits you'd like to send in, send in an email to dopeypodcast uh, at gmail.com. And I want to read one more email uh, before we get to our big guest. This is from uh, a woman named Jan Kell, and she writes, Dave, I am a mother of an addicted 27-year-old man. My beautiful baby boy just cannot get clean. He started with heroin at age 17 and now is addicted to meth and crack. My son has been in and out of jail, spent two years in prison and many rehabs. I have recently been trying to distance myself from him because he causes so much stress and drama. I just recently found the Dopey Podcast. I've been listening while at work, and I am currently on episode 82 or something like that. I have loved listening to you guys. It's nice to laugh at drugs sometimes to help deal with the pain. So just now I decided to check out your website and maybe order some merchandise. I had no idea Chris had died. I'm sitting at work trying to hide my tears. I am so sorry for your loss and everyone's loss of this wonderfully talented young man. I have a lot of podcasts to listen to, and I will continue to listen. I do believe you are helping many, many people. I just wanted to let you know that you are also helpful to family members of addicts. Thanks for all you do. Stay strong. And that's from Jan Kell. And I'm sorry about your son. Um, You know, the good news is 
he can get it together. You know, I mean, the the it is a crazy and terrible thing that uh, that Chris died uh, using, and he died making the show. And it's it's something that I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, the summertime is a huge trigger for me. Uh, when I garden or when I do anything in the backyard, it takes me right back to when Chris died two years ago. And um, the point is that if you're using, it can kill you. But if you're still alive, you can get better. And I think that is a really, really, really important message uh, to put into the show. You know, that this shit will kill you. And, and if you can get out of this shit, you can have a good life. That is the, the message. The message. That is the message. And um, love the Dopey Nation. Love everything you guys are doing. Um, love to hear from you. Uh, this week, we have a treat. We have a totally different kind of episode. There is a uh, very renowned and scholarly journalist and writer named Johan Hari. He's from England. He did a bunch of TED Talks. He wrote two very, very important books about addiction and depression. And uh, me and him had a really cool Zoom conversation. So here he is, straight from London, Johan Hari. I, you know, I expected your title to be more than renowned author and journalist, but what would you call yourself besides a renowned author and journalist? Oh, I wouldn't call myself renowned. That meant- You're very renowned. His name is, is Johan Hari. He's, he's coming to me from London via Zoom. It's an honor, and welcome to Dopey. Hi, it's good to be with you, David. I'm really chuffed. So, so what would you, just journalist, author, uh, deep thinker, philosophizer, what, what would you say? I'm a, I'm a journalist, yeah, I'm a journalist. And your quote-unquote claim to fame comes from, I mean, you wrote two books, one about depression and one about addiction, and um, really fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I would say out of every five people that come on Dopey, three of them say the opposite of addiction is connection. Uh, and, and, and only one of them can trace it to you. So I'm like... I got to fucking get jo- Johan on the phone. I, and I also, I worked at Katz's Deli, like I told you. And um, for eight years, my I was a waiter. And the guy who cut the pastrami was a young Dominican meat cutter named Johan. And Johan was like my mortal enemy. But I loved him. He would fuck with me constantly. And when I see your name, Johan, I just think of Johan. So for, if I ever say Johan, it's because I'm conditioned to it. That's all right. I love, I love Katz's Deli. At least one of my chins is due to Katz's Deli when I lived in New York. So I'm very happy about that. Also, calling me Johan, people have made it much worse. I once waited for six hours in an emergency room because they were calling for Joanna Harry to come forward. So anyone who gets my name better than that is fine by me. Fair enough. Well, we will not call you jo- Johanna Harry. That's a great Americanized Johan Hari. I love that. Um, what drew you to addiction and depression in the first place? Well, it was kind of different for each of them, but for addiction, um, we had a lot of addiction in my family. And one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and I didn't, uh, I didn't understand why then, but as I got older, I realized we had addiction, drug addiction in my family. And like a lot of people, I think, who grow up in a situation where there's a lot of addiction, um, you know, it feels very familiar. You feel drawn to that, that uh, to, well, to people with addiction problems. And so as I got older, it wasn't just a family thing. It was, you know, um, my boyfriend and a lot, a lot of, I was drawn to lots of people in my life who'd had addiction problems. And when I started writing my book about this, Chasing the Scream, about God, it's nine, nine years ago now, I think. Eight, nine and a half, eight and a half years ago. Um, you know, some of the people I loved were in a really, really bad state. And I wanted to figure out what would help them. I wanted to figure out what I could do. I wanted to understand it better. So for the book, I ended up going on this crazy journey. I ended up traveling over 30,000 miles. Uh, I wanted to meet the leading experts in the world about addiction, about what reduces addiction, uh, what doesn't work with addiction. And I, and I just got to know so many people, like, a, you know, from a transgender crack dealer in, in Brooklyn, who's one of the smartest people I know, to um, 
I was just texting with just now actually uh, to not to order any crack I should add uh, uh, to a kind of hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel um, to the only country that's decriminalized all drugs with incredible results so that was really why I wanted to understand it better and why I cared so much about it and I'm, I'm so glad I I'm so glad I went on that journey because it really changed changed my life well, it's amazing. And, and as you're tracking down all the information and kind of getting these stories and these interviews, like, I mean, your opinion about this stuff has really changed the dialogue. I mean, maybe it's your collating and going through all this information, but it's provided the world with a real new lens to see addiction. Did you, did you feel that happening when you were writing Chasing the Scream? Did you feel like, I'm onto something? It was more than that. It changed my mind in a really deep way deep way um on on lots of things actually and and even and just as much with the book i wrote about depression lost connections which is quite related in many ways but no i mean it was it was a really strange thing to realize that this thing that i had seen playing out since i was a kid addiction was something i had actually deeply misunderstood so uh, there's many aspects of this but we can start with one which is if you had asked me, you know, eight and a half years ago when I started doing the research, what causes heroin addiction, right? Let's choose that because it's close. it was close to me at the time. Um, I would have looked at you like you were an idiot and I would have said, well, David, the clue's in the name, right? Obviously, addicted heroin, heroin addiction is caused by heroin, right? We've been told this story for 100 years that's become totally part of our common sense. It was definitely part of mine. Um, this, uh, uh, and this story isn't totally wrong, but it turns out to be a, a, a surprisingly small part of the picture. Um, so we think if you know if if you or I kidnapped the next twenty people who walked past your apartment, and we injected them all with heroin every day for a month, like a villain in a Saw movie, right? At the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason: there's chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to desperately physically crave. And that's what addiction is, right? This tremendous physical hunger for the drug. That's why we call it being hooked, right? The first thing that led to me to the fact that that's, that can't be the whole of the picture is when it was explained to me in Britain, where I'm from, as you can tell from my weird Downton Abbey accent, um, it, if I stepped out of this interview now and I got hit by a truck and I broke my hip, I'd be taken to hospital and I'd be given a lot of a drug called diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's much better shit than you'll ever score on the streets because it's medically pure heroin, right? Um, if th- This is given out in British hospitals fairly often. If anyone listening to this interview has a British grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, your grandmother's taken a lot of really, really good heroin, right? But don't don't give our audience any ideas. <laughs> is, I, I've been seeking out dimorphine my whole life, and I never I never got, got to find it. it. I was dealing with the transgendered crack dealer selling me shitty dope, and I'd be like, "That was good." So let's not give the audience any good ideas here. Okay. okay well, just in defense of Chino, he would never sell shitty dope. But the um, the the you know, but if what we think about if what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused primarily or entirely by the chemical hooks. What should be happening to all these people in hospitals in Britain, right, who having hip replacement operations? Some of them should be leaving and trying to score on the streets. This has been studied very carefully. It never happens, right? And when I learned that, I just thought, that can't be right. How could you have a situation where you'd have someone in a hospital bed being given loads of really potent heroin and they never become addicted, and someone in the street outside shooting up in an alleyway using actually a much weaker form of the drug, and they do become do frequently become addicted. I was like, that doesn't, how could, that doesn't make sense. And I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an incredible man you should totally talk to on your podcast named Bruce Alexander. He's a professor there, professor of psychology. And Bruce did an experiment in the 1970s that has really transformed how we think about addiction across the world and actually led to some really incredible changes. I mean, Bruce is a totally amazing human being as well. Um, So Bruce explained to me the story that we've got in our heads, that 
that addiction is primarily or entirely caused by the chemical hoax comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They are really simple experiments. Your listeners can do them at home if they feel a bit sadistic. You take a rat. Can we please spare the, li- the listeners? We, gotta, we, we want the listeners to thrive. We do not want to put the coke in the... Li- we don't want them to experiment with the dimorphine or with the... Well, they, they can do it to the rat. Okay, they can do it to the rat. Okay, they can do yeah, it to yeah. their hamster. Just, no, no, they should just experiment just... on themselves. I'm not saying, like, you okay. should try... Yeah, yeah, to be clear, I'm not okay. suggesting that people... Be... Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. I don't want to lead your, your listeners to die, right? And this is, this is the great rat park, by the way. This is something that we used to talk about on the show... My, I told you about my friend Chris. He was a, um, a PsyD student, and he would talk about Rat Park. So, audience, get ready, because this is going to be a much more explained version of Rat Park, because we, we love the Rat Park story. So, please. He explained to me that this, this story that we have, I've just said that, haven't I? I'm so brain dead today. So, just saying, the story we have comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. Did I say that? I interrupted you because I'm a rude American. I, no, I would, no, 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 no. The same I, thing. I, I love Americans. I'm um, a rude Jewish I'm, American. I might just, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize to listeners. I'm, I've had so much caffeine today, and I'm in that mode where you have to either have more caffeine or you'll just crash. So I apologize. I've been trying to do too much today. But So Bruce explained to me this story we have um, that addiction is caused primarily or entirely by the chemical hooks comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century, right? They're really simple experiments. You take a rat, you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will try both, almost always prefer the drug water, and almost always kill itself within a couple of weeks. So there you go, right? That's our story. It makes perfect sense. I have a question about this, though. And then do rats prefer the coke or the heroin mostly? Like what did, what did, did he? I don't think there was a comparison where they. That's the, that's the study that I want to see. Like do rats it. prefer coke or I, I can't be dealing with coke and heroin or rats. My, my, my <laughs> life is rat free, coke free. I love the implication that you've got a rat addiction as well. So in the 70s, Professor Alexander comes along and he says, hang on a minute. He looks at these experiments. He's like, hang on a minute. You put the rat alone in an empty cage it's got nothing to do except use these drugs what would happen if we did this differently so he built a cage that he called rat park which is basically heaven for rats right they've got loads of friends they've got loads of cheese they can have loads of sex anything a rat can want in life is there in rat park and they've got both the water bottles the normal water and the drug water and of course they try both this is the fascinating thing in rat park they don't particularly like the drug water. None of them use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and overdose when the rats do not have the things that make life worth meaningful for them to none when they do have the things that make life worth meaningful for them. And there's lots of human examples I'm sure we'll get to, but I remember, I remember the second time I saw Bruce, we were on the downtown east side of Vancouver, and I, I walked away, and for people who don't know the downtown east side, it's an area with a lot of um, chaotic addiction on the streets and people who are really suffering. And I remember walking out, we, we met in the, there's a library on the downtown east side, and I remember walking out of the library and just walking and sitting in a place called Pigeon Park where a lot of people sit and shoot up. And, um, and I remember looking at them and thinking about the, the, the rats and thinking... Huh. So kind of what he's saying is the opposite of addiction is connection. And I I remember that moment very, very clearly. Um, And so it's super moving to me when I always think of that moment when people come up to me in the street or they, people have been printing it on T-shirts and, um, or I hear it. And it's always most moving when I hear it said back to me and people don't know that that I said it. Um, And yeah, I think there's, so uh, Bruce, you know, freed up so much. I mean, Bruce has done a lot more work on addiction than that and, uh, and given us a lot more insights. But, uh, you know, something I didn't put in the book because I didn't know it. I only, funny, Bruce only told it to me when I saw him in Vancouver about a year ago. Um, 
I, I never thought to ask him, but someone said they'd asked him, what happened to the rats when the experiment was over? That's and a great question. Said, and he said, um, he took them up into the mountains outside Vancouver and he let them go. And I really love that because I think in a, in a way it's like these rats were set free, but also they helped to set free so many people around the world by changing our understanding, right? Well, the, the first thing that, I mean, I, I, I always wanted to hear that story. And, um, you know, Chris used to tell it on the show and I didn't understand it. And, and the first time I really, I, I, didn't, I didn't trust his source. But when I heard you talk about it and, and I read your, you, you describe it, it really made sense to me. When I came up um, and I got addicted to heroin and, um, you know, I was, you know, using marijuana every day. I was taking pills. But when I got addicted to heroin, I had a ton of connection in my life and I had a ton of action in my life. You know, I was a, a television producer. I lived in Manhattan. I was in my family. And still, the, I, I guess the, the chemical hook of the heroin, it also ignited some other thing in my head where I left the, the, the great life that I was in. I, I gave up all the connections for the connection to the dope. And, um, you know, I just... I find it uh, almost hard to understand how the the inverse of the story. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do people that become addicted get addicted when they have so much going on in their life? Or, or is that where trauma comes in? So I think you've gone to a really important question. And it was actually because of that question that I wrote my second book, Lost Connections. It was really an attempt to answer that. So I would say a few things. Firstly, it's important to say... The chemical hook story is real. It's just one part of a bigger picture. So, and there's, a, there's lots of ways we know this. Lots of scientists have shown this. But I'll just give you a very easy and obvious example um, of an experiment, actually, that some people listening will be taking part in right now, actually. Which is, um, so the most powerful chemical... There's a very strong agreement the most powerful chemical hook is in tobacco, and it's nicotine, right? So... My mother smokes 70 cigarettes a day, right? Uh, there's a photograph of me and her when I'm a baby, whereas um, she's breastfeeding me, smoking and resting the ashtray on my stomach, right? This was Scottish parenting in the 70s. When I found this photo a couple of years back, I showed it to her. I thought she'd be, feel really guilty. She said, you were a fucking difficult baby. I needed that cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> In the unlikely event that my mother ever tried to stop smoking, which she never would, she's so happy by the news that, um, you, know, you know, smokers are less likely to get coronavirus. I didn't, I didn't know Yeah, that. yeah, it's but significantly less likely to die of it, that we don't understand why yet. And my mother's like, ha, you fuckers told me to stop smoking for my health. I'll be the last one fucking left. Um, but anyway, so in the unlikely event that my mother tries to stop smoking, um, the thing she will physically crave is nicotine, Right. So in the late 1980s, scientists who believed, okay, so addiction is about the chemical hooks, they're addicted to the chemical hook, people start saying, well, how else could we give them the chemical hook? So in the late 1980s, um, scientists invented nicotine patches. And there's this huge wave of optimism, because they're like, shit, we can give people all of the chemical hook they're craving, but none of this, they won't need any of this filthy cancer-causing smoke, people are going to stop smoking. And People, you know, people my age will remember nicotine patches came on the market. Uh, my mother decided to just wear them in addition to the amount she smoked because she thought, oh, I guess you had an even better fucking fix. But, um, she was committed. Exactly. Um, but, um, you know, and they became commercially available. And what happened? According to the US Surgeon General's report, 17% of highly motivated smokers can stop when they use nicotine patches, right? Now, it's important to say that ain't nothing, right? 17%, that's a lot of people. Um, that saved, across the world, hundreds of thousands of lives at a very conservative estimate. That's real. But that also leaves us with 87% that has to be explained some other way, right? So it's not the chemical hooks aren't real. Anyone who's been through a heroin withdrawal knows perfectly well the chemical hooks are very fucking real. It's that it's one part of a bigger picture. So what else is going on? And um, it's interesting because when I first started talking about Rat Park and I, and, I, and I explained that line, the opposite of addiction is connection, a lot of people interpreted that in a more narrow way than I intended. 
So I'd get a lot of people who would say things like, um, well, I had lots of friends, or my husband has lots of friends and he's still addicted. I never thought Rat Park was entirely about, I mean, part of it is about social connections, but I never thought that was the main lesson of Rat Park. Right? I always thought it was a much, uh, much more complicated uh, than that. It's about having connection to your deepest needs as a human being, right? right. So everyone knows they have natural physical needs. Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning. You right. need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. It's all sorts of things that human beings need. And, you know, this culture we built is good at lots of things. I'm, I'm glad to be alive today. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs that people have, which is one of the reasons why we have a rising epidemic of depression, anxiety, and addiction. And it's not the only reason. Um, and, and so, in a way... The journey I went on for Lost Connections was much more, and I think answering what you're saying about yourself and lots of other people. So, you know, uh, one of the people who praised Chasing the Screen was um, Elton John. And I remember uh, someone saying to me, well, but Elton John had everything. He disproves your theory, right? He had everything. You're like, right, if you think the game, if you think that what humans need is money and fame, yeah, you're right, Elton had everything. Right. Right. Turns out that's not what people need, Right. And I think part of the problem is there's such a gap between in this culture what we've told people they need than what between that and what people actually need. Right. right. So I think a lot of people go, well, I won the game, right? I had everything you need. And then you say, well, tell me what you had. And they'll start talking about money and status and, or whatever it is. And then you go, right, that, but that's not what you need. That, that I mean, those things can help you in some circumstances. I'm not opposed to having money or fame or whatever, but that's not, those aren't your deep psychological needs, right? Does that, how does that ring true to you about your own experience, David? Well, I think it rings very true. Um, I think I craved what Elton John had, just I had much less talent. I craved <laughs> money, and I craved fame, and I craved... All those things. The reason I, I went straight for heroin was because my brain was was constantly doubting me. I, I would hear doubts in my head. I would hear criticism. I would be stressed out. I would be neurotic. I was uh, uncomfortable in my skin, and I craved a break. You know. So so I think I, I was looking for something I didn't have. But the thing that popped into my head when you talked about Elton John and you talked about. Um, you know, I, I think the other side of all this stuff is like when we when we got on the phone in the first place, or we got on the Zoom meeting in the first place. You asked me how I was doing. I mean, we're we're in a crazy moment in history. The world is basically ending around us, and I said I'm doing pretty well, considering. And and I think for me, I needed to go through hell to to realize what was valuable and and what made me feel good deep down you know i i i have a job that i never wanted in a deli i have a a family that uh i take care of and that takes care of me um but i have purpose you know and that's like where we're going i think like if you can have a purpose that you can meet your purpose you don't necessarily crave you know the heroin infused water or just shooting dope or or smoking or whatever you know like i i got to the other side and but i needed Somehow, I mean, it doesn't even matter if I needed it or I didn't need it because I needed it to get here. You know, like my wife will ask me, you can't regret using because you wouldn't have us if you hadn't used, you know. And I don't know how I would have gotten here without the pain, you know. Um, I think one of my favorite things that I encountered from your work is the connection between your studies on addiction and depression, that the answer is to belong to something, to be part of something, you know, and, and, and in 12 step, it becomes higher power and all this stuff. But the fellowship is also a huge part of it. And what I get from the links in your work is that it's being part of a tribe. It's being part of a culture. It's belonging. That really is the answer or helpful in the answer. Does that, does that, 
make sense? Yeah, totally. I think you put that really well. I think it's a key part of the answer. I was thinking as you were saying that about meaning, you know, this is one of the hardest, for lost connections, this is one of the hardest, um, one of the most challenging things I learned. And it's slightly embarrassing to say that because when you explain it, it seems kind of obvious. But so just like junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? And I don't say that with any sense of superiority. They just started delivering KFC again in Britain and I cried with happiness. But just like that kind of junk, we all know junk food appeals to the part of us that needs nutrition, but actually fucks us up, right? There's also evidence that a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're going to feel like shit, right? That's not an exact quote from Confucius, but that is basically what he said. But weirdly, nobody had scientifically investigated this until an amazing man I interviewed and spent time with named Professor Tim Kasser, who just retired from Knox College in Illinois. Professor Kasser um, did an incredible amount of research um, over 30 years and discovered loads of things, but I think the heart of what, for the purposes of what we're talking about, the heart of what he discovered is, firstly, the more you think life is about money and status and showing off, the kind of values promoted by Instagram and advertising and everything like it, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious. And we know depression and anxiety make you much more likely to become addicted. And secondly, he showed that as a society, as a culture, we've become much more driven by these values all throughout my lifetime. I'm 41. And you know, I remember Professor Kasser explaining this to me and having this weird feeling because at first I thought, oh, this is kind of obvious, right? Everyone knows they're not going to lie on their deathbed and think about all the shoes they bought and all the likes they got on Instagram, right? You're going to think about moments of love and meaning and connection in your life. But as Professor Kasser put it to me, yeah, but we live in a machine that is designed to get us to neglect what is important about life right? Uh, More 18-month-old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name. From the moment we're born, we're immersed in this machinery that tells us, if you don't feel good, there's an answer for that. Go and buy a load of shit. Work hard. Buy a load of shit. Display it on social media. Make other people jealous. You still don't feel good? Work harder. Buy more shit. Display that on social media. We're we're trapped in this machinery of consumption. And and it's interesting because, and just like junk food appeals to the part that needs nutrition but but screws with it everyone needs a system of values to guide them through life and what this this does is it tells you it trains you to seek happiness in all the wrong places places where you will not find it right we've all had the experience of you know you go and buy some expensive thing you get a rush you get home and then you just feel empty right um you know that's a very common um sensation um, and you see that from, you know, the most materialistic and wealthy people you meet are as miserable as shit, you know. Um, and so I think that that really speaks to what you were saying, David, about, you know, when people say to me, right, but I had everything. What, it can't be that I became addicted because I was unhappy because I had everything. And I always say, tell me what you had. And it's never, well, I had a strong sense of meaning and purpose in my life and I had loads of people who supported that sense of meaning and purpose and I felt secure and I felt like I was helping other people. That's never, literally never once has anyone said that to me when they were having this, that kind of conversation, right? It's always, they go, well, I had a hot wife and I had an expensive car and I was making loads of money or I had a job at Goldman Sachs or whatever the fuck it was. And to me, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. And you can be in pain and not know why. In fact, that's the norm in, for humans, right? You know, um, in psychology, it's called the fundamental misattribution principle. We think we know why we feel the way we do, but very often we don't, right? Very often you think, oh, I feel bad for this reason, but it turns out you felt bad for another reason. Um, so... I mean, I think there's a, a, a many implications of that, but relating it to what you were saying about 12 Steps programs, like one of the most interesting pieces, I mean, Professor Kasser did so much interesting research, but one of them he did has really stay with me because it, it, 
I really realised as I was speaking to Professor Kasser how much in my own life, when I felt bad, I would try to gain some external achievement, right? I would try to look clever, I would try to get something to go viral on social media, whatever it was. Um, I was never a super materialistic person in terms of buying things, but, you know, these are other forms of materialism, right? And and, and it, it was really embarrassing to us. Oh, I was making a really basic mistake, right? But anyway, Professor Cassidy did this really interesting bit of research. He teamed up with this guy called Nathan Dungan, who's a... Um, Nathan is a... Who I interviewed him. Nathan's a financial advisor in Minneapolis. And he got... His job is basically to advise people on the, like, their family budget. And he got contacted by a school, a kind of middle-class school. It wasn't a fancy neighbourhood. It wasn't a poor neighbourhood. And they said, look, could you help us? We've got a problem. The kids in our school are getting completely obsessed with getting the light, latest Nike sneakers, the latest, you know, iPhone or whatever it was. And they're really freaking out if their parents can't afford it and they're going, they're losing their shit. Could you come and just talk to them and explain budgeting? So he comes into the school and he starts telling them about budgeting and quickly realizes these kids don't give a fuck about budgets, right? They just, they just want this thing and they're going crazy if they don't have it. So Nathan had, had uh, read Professor Cass's work, Tim Cass's work. So they teamed up and they did this experiment. So they got uh, parents and their teenagers to come to a meeting. It was once every couple of weeks for months. And at the first meeting, they said to them, Make a list of everything you've got to have. And they didn't define what that meant. So, of course, at first, everyone says, like, food, water, that kind of thing. But quite quickly, people start listing things they've got to have that are not, like, physical essentials, like Nike sneakers, iPhone. The new Yeezy model, yes. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, I'm pleased to say I don't even know what that is. So, thank God. Yeah, very don't tell fortunate. me. Don't, don't, it might crowd smooth something useful out of my head. Um, the... And the parents started naming very kind of materialistic things as well. And, and Nathan said to them, okay, now I want you to write about how you will feel if you get those things. How will your life be different? And interestingly, no one named the, the kind of ostensible purpose of the object. No one said, I want the Nike sneakers because I want to be a basketball player and I want to be able to jump higher, right? No one said that. They said things like, well, I want to be accepted by the group. I want people to envy me. I want to have status, that kind of thing. And it doesn't take long for people to say that out loud before they go, huh, why do I think I would have status just if I had like a little plastic tick on my shoe, right? Why would that be? We all think that we've created this system of values. We don't want to admit that actually this was just pumped into your head by really rich people who want to fuck with your head and make you spend money on bullshit, right? But the next part of the experiment to me was the most interesting, where as the weeks went on, they would say to them, okay, Let's write, let, just describe a moment, in, and I really recommend people try this, describe a moment in your life where you have felt like you have meaning and purpose. And, you know, different people named different things. Some people it was playing music, some people it was writing, some people it was running on the beach, whatever it might be. And, and people started asking, okay, well, how could you build more of your life around pursuing these feelings of meaning and connection and less around buying shit you don't need? And the group would just check in. And what, the, what was really interesting is what they found is just having these conversations, just checking in with each other, led to a measurable shift in what people valued, what people thought was important, which we know leads to lower depression and anxiety, and I would argue addiction. And, and so these insights are just beneath the surface, right? It's not like you could stop any American, the most you know, right-wing, MAGA hat-wearing person in Miami... Uh, in a gated community in Miami and, you know, the most liberal person in West Baltimore or the Upper East Side. And they all get it, right? I've spoken to such completely different divergent political groups about this, people with very different politics. These are not difficult things to see. It's not like explaining quantum physics to people, right? These insights, and this is one of the things Professor Castle showed, these insights are just beneath the surface. That's, that's one of many things that's going on. I don't want to, that's not the whole thing, right? Obviously, the books are about, that's just one chapter in, in one of the books. But I think one of the few good things about this terrible crisis we're going through is that it's an opportunity 
to reconsider our values, right? Who were the people we really needed when, you know, when people couldn't leave their homes? Who was allowed out of their home, homes? It was people who did the kind of jobs my family did. My grandmother was a cleaner. My dad was a bus driver. Who did we need, right? Turns out it wasn't Wall Street billionaires. They can fuck off. We don't need them at all, right? Turns out, you know, it wasn't Instagram influencers that we needed, right? It was people doing the things that have been devalued and, and, and shit on for a really long time. Um, so if there's one of the few good things that can be, a bit, I mean, there's no guarantee it'll be like this. We have to make it this way. But, but this can be a chance to reevaluate where we've gone wrong in terms of our values. Right, like what's important. Um, my, my favorite thing, I, I mean, I love when you talk about Portugal. Like I find that to be fascinating. But I also just like where we're at here in terms of like, core values, being a part of a community. Like, like I, I remember hearing you say how funny it is that people kind of st- uh, stress on people to be themselves, but how being themselves usually is what gets them into trouble in the first place, and how when they find their place within a community, they find their value. You know, like, like when I started doing Dopey, I did it as a thing to have fun with my friend. You know, it was like a joke. And it was a way, you know, I needed something. I mean, my big thing about getting sober was like being busy was like fucking everything. Having a purpose so that I wouldn't get stuck with a brain wondering what I'm supposed to be doing. So I just needed stuff to do. So we started doing Dopey and and we got a lot out of just doing it. Then when we started hearing back from people, it was like, holy cow, people love it. People feel connected to it. And, and then after um, Chris died, they invented uh, this thing on Facebook, which was a fan group called the Dopey Nation. And there's thousands of people on there that are supporting each other. And people are actually getting sober just being a support to each other within this group of people that call themselves the Dopey Nation, which really reminds me of your talks about depression, about finding your tribe, about feeling a, a sense of belonging. And um, and I didn't, I mean, I probably knew it in some way that that was what was happening, but it didn't click in until I heard you say it in one of your TED Talks. So I think it, it's pretty amazing, you know, like, like when you discover that and when you discover the connection between what helps depression and what helps addiction? Was it like an aha, or were you seeking the, the the second phase of your addiction study, or did you have an idea in the first place, or is that question totally misconstrued? No, Not well it's thought a good out. Question. I'm just thinking about that. To me, it's more. You know, there's all sorts of things I learned from scientists um, in the research for both my books. And lots of details and lots of solutions, and I hope we talk about Portugal and other places. But I think some of the most powerful moments were actually just moments of a deep emotional resonance where I felt the truth of something. I'll give you an example of one of the places. I think the people at this place think I'm completely fucking insane because I would just turn up every mu- every couple of months and just burst into tears because I found them so moving. So. Um, my, my, my parents lived in Berlin for a long time. My brother was born there. It's a place I really like. And in, in the summer of 2011, in Berlin, uh, a Turkish-German woman named Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and she put a sign in her window. So Nuria lived on the ground floor of a housing project. And the sign she put in her window said, something like, I got a notice saying I'm going to be evicted from my home next Thursday. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to kill myself. Now, this housing project is it's called Cotti. It's in a, a Kreuzberg, for people who know Berlin, and it's, it's actually a very poor part of Berlin. Um, and for a really long time, there were only kind of three kinds of people who lived there. There were recent Muslim immigrants, like this woman, Nuria. There were gay men, and there were punk squatters. And, you know, as you can imagine, these three groups didn't really get along, but no one really knew anyone anywhere. It was very isolated, very poor. A lot of people were being evicted um, because the whole city was gentrifying, but Berlin, in, but this part of Berlin in particular was gentrifying. So their rents were massively going up. So people have started walking past Nuria's window and they see this sign saying she's going to kill herself. And no one knows her, but they knock on her door. They're like, do you need any help, lady? 
And she said, fuck you, I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself. And she shut the door in their face. But people started talking outside her apartment. And one of them had an idea. They were like, there's this big thoroughfare that goes through Cotty into the center of Berlin. And one of them was like, you know, if we block the road on Saturday and we protest, there'll be a bit of a fuss. They'll probably let her stay in her apartment. There might even be some pressure to keep our rents down. Why don't we try it? So the Saturday came and they blocked the road just with chairs and stuff. And Nuria was like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. I might as well let these people push me into the middle of the road. So they push her into the middle of the road. And the media do turn up. And yeah, it's a bit of a story in Berlin that day and the TV crews come. And then it gets to the end of the day and the police are like, okay, you had your fun, take it down. But the people in Cotty said, well, you haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. And actually, we want a rent freeze for our entire housing project. When we get that, we'll take this down. But of course, they knew the minute they left this barricade, the police would just tear it down and that would be the end of it. So one of my very favorite people in Cotty, uh, one of the punk squatters, a woman named Tanya Gartner, she wears tiny little miniskirts, even in Berlin winters, Tanya is hardcore. Um, Tanya had an idea. She said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We can drop a timetable to man this barricade 24 hours a day until we've got what we want, a rent freeze for everyone, and Nuria gets to stay. Um, and in her apartment, she had a klaxon, you know, those things that make super loud noises at soccer matches. Uh, so she went and got it. She said, okay, man the barricade 24 hours a day. If the police come to tear it down, let off the klaxon, we'll all come down from our apartments and we'll stop them. So people start signing up to man the barricade, people who would never have met, right? Had never met and would never have met to get these kind of unlikely pairings. So Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab, gets paired with Tanya, who wears this tiny little miniskirt, right? And if I remember right, Tanya and Nuria had, I think it was the Thursday night shift. And the first few nights they sit there together, they're like, this is awful. We have got nothing in common, right? We could, couldn't have less in common. Um, you know, Tanya would just sit there on her laptop. But as the nights went on, they started talking Tanya and Nuria discovered they had something incredibly powerful in common. Um, Nuria had come to Berlin when she was 17 from her village in Turkey, and she had two babies. And she'd come and she was meant to earn enough money to send back for her husband in Turkey to come and join her. So she was working every hour she could, looking after her kids. And after she'd been there for 18 months, just as she almost had the money, she got word from home that her husband had died in Turkey. And sitting there in the cold in Cotty with Tanya, she told her something she'd never told anyone in Germany before. She'd always told people that her husband had died of a heart attack. Actually, he died of TB, tuberculosis, which was seen as like a shameful disease of poverty. But she told Tanya the truth. That's when Tanya started to talk about something that she never talked about. She had come to Berlin when she was 15. To, sorry, she'd come to Cotty when she was 15. She got thrown out by her middle-class family because they couldn't, because she was obsessed with punk. And she came to live in one of the squats in Cotty. And not long after she arrived, she got pregnant. And so Tanya and Nuria discovered, realized that they had both been kind of kids with kids of their own in this place where they hadn't really understood where they were. They realized they were incredibly similar. They kept, became very good friends. These pairings were happening all over Cotty. You know, there was um, a young Turkish-German lad named Mehmet who kept being nearly thrown out of school because... Um, they said he had ADHD and he got paired with this very grumpy old white guy called Dieter who said he didn't believe in direct action because he loved Stalin but in this case he'd make an exception and he started helping Mehmet with his homework and Mehmet started doing much better when they did their shifts together. Um, directly opposite this, this, this um, housing project there's a, a gay club called Zudblock run by a man I absolutely love called Richard Stein who, who um, to give you a sense of what he's like the previous place he owned was called Cafe Anal, right? So okay. um, it's a pretty hard... I always thought you wouldn't have a sound hardcore. Hardcore. I'm yeah. with you. It's a hardcore gay club, right? Um, and uh, when the protest began, the people who run the block, um, they gave all their furniture to the protest and after a while they started giving people free drinks and free food. And after the protest had been going on for about three months... Um, 
they, people at Zublock said, you know, you guys should have your meetings in our, in our club, right? We'll give you free drinks and everything. Just come and meet here. And even the, like, super progressive people in Cotty were like, look, we're not going to get these very religious Muslims to come and have meetings underneath posters for fisting night, right? It's not going to happen. It did happen. As one of the Turkish-German women there, Nerim and Manker, said to me, we all realized we had to take these small steps to understand each other. After the protest had been going on for a year, they built a, <laughs> their block in the road had become a full, because lots of the people there are construction workers, they built this full, uh, con- like, building in the middle of the road with, like, a roof. It's really nice. And after it had been going on for about a year, um, a guy turned up, his name was Tunkai. Um, and Tunkai had clearly been homeless. He was in his early 50s. And when you meet him, it's clear he's got some kind of cognitive um, difficulties. But he had an amazing energy about him. Uh, He's very warm. He hugs everyone. And he started helping out. And after he'd been there for a little while, a few weeks, people at Cotty said, look, we don't want you to be homeless. You should come and live in this thing we've built. We really like you. So he came to live there, and he became a much-loved part of the Cotty protest. And after he'd been there for nine months, one day the police came to inspect it. They would come and do this every now and then. And Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue, and he thought the police were arguing, so he went to try to hug the police officers. But they thought he was attacking them, so they arrested him. Right. That was when it was discovered. Tunkai had been shut away for 20 years in a psychiatric hospital, often literally in a padded cell. Um, so they took him back to this psychiatric hospital right the other side of Berlin. I think it was in Charlottenburg. And at this point... The entire Cotty protest turned into a free Tunkai movement, right? They descend on this psychiatric hospital, dozens and dozens of them, um, to get him out. And these psychiatrists are like, what the fuck is this? They've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years who escaped one day, and suddenly they've got these women in hijabs, these very camp gay men, and these punks demanding his release but i remember the most diverse diverse movement in the history of the psychiatric (laughs) exactly yeah and and i remember one of the protesters uli hartman said to them yeah but the thing is you don't love him he doesn't belong with you we love him he belongs with us anyway many things happened at Koti. they got tunkai back it took a while he lives there still they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project They then launched a referendum initiative to freeze rents across the city. It got the largest number of written signatures in the history of the city of Berlin. They now have a rent freeze across the whole of Berlin. But I remember the last time I saw Nuria, the woman who'd started all this, you know, she said to me, I'm really glad I got to stay in my neighborhood. That's great. I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along and I would never have known. Right. I, remember, I remember, you know, Nereman, one of the other uh, Turkish German women there, saying to me, you know, when I grew up in Turkey, I grew up in a village, right? And I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in the Western world and I learned that here, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls. And if you're lucky, your family. And she said, then this whole protest began And I started to think of all these people in this whole place as my home. And she said she realized, in some sense, in this culture, we're homeless. You know, the Bosnian writer Alexander Heyman said, home is where people notice when you're not there. By that standard, a lot of us are homeless, right? And and it was so clear to me in Cotty what the, you know, what... one of so many things that these scientists have in fact taught me and given me the evidence for, but that we've become such a disconnected culture. These people at Cotty in the main didn't need to be drugged. They needed to be together. They needed to be seen. They needed to be valued. They needed, right. to, you know, they needed to be held and seen and have a purpose and people who liked them and admired them and needed them. Um, and knew them, actually knew them, and shared shared a story that they didn't even think that they would have shared. You know what? A, it's what a beautiful story. And it's Tanya said to me. Actually, I remember one time we were sitting outside Ziploc, this gay club, and Tanya said to me, "When you're all alone and you feel like shit, you think there's something wrong with you. But what we did is we came out of our corner crying, and we started to fight. 
and we realized we were surrounded by people who felt the same way. And to me, you know, I think you can tell I love these people in Cotty, but in many ways, they're not exceptional. These were randomly selected people. What it took, what was exceptional was that they came together, right? What was exceptional was that they let out the signal of distress and other people responded to it. And to me, that was, that was what was so powerful. So when you ask about when I was learning about these things, of course, there was a lot of intellectual discovery in the process for both of the books. But as much as the intellectual discovery, it was these emotional resonances. You know, uh, I remember one of the people at Cotty, Sandy, saying to me, Johan, do you think maybe you have allergies? Because like, my eyes were <laughs> crying so your much. eyes. Out I was the thinking, whole just time. Like, no, it's really fucking moving, right? Like, and he just, you know, in that very German way, it was just like, oh, yes, I see. <laughs> you know, but, no, I, I, I love that story. And it, and it does totally remind me of this dopey nation, this ragtag bunch of misfit toys who get to find each other and find purpose. And it also reminds me of like when a 12 step room works. You know, when, because it doesn't always work. It, things have to click and people have to bond and, and people need to recognize each other and, and see the need that they fulfill for each other. But what a beautiful story. And also just like, what a cool thing you've gotten to do, you know, like hunting down, um, you know, chasing a story and it turns into such an emotional thing. And it, and like, I'm sitting here thinking like, I don't really understand necessarily what a writer does or what a journalist does because I'm sitting here thinking, did you know you were going to help so many people when you did this? Like, was that part of the aim in becoming a writer and a journalist, to be a bridge, to be a storyteller that, that brings out healing? You know, it's such healing stuff. It's difficult, isn't it? Because if I think about why I became a journalist, I had this very strong... Well, firstly, it's literally the only thing I can do. <laughs> like, I'm shit at everything else. But um, I think there's lots of reasons, and I, and I like the actual process of writing, and I like, you know, intellectual discovery. But I also had a very strong sense becoming a writer. You know, my I was raised by my grandmother. My mother was ill a lot when I was a child, and my dad was in a different country a lot of the time. And um, my grandmother, you know, my grandmother left school when she was 13. She had a really hard life. Both my grandmothers had hard lives. But my maternal grandmother in particular had a really hard life. You know, she grew up in a working class part of Scotland. Left school when she was 13. Her husband died when she was young. She had to really struggle and fight to survive. And I had a very strong sense as a kid, because I adored my grandmother, um, that very few people had stood up for my grandmother in her life that some people had but um actually including my father who was her son-in-law who you know my dad's a complex person but he, he stood up for her a lot and I remember thinking oh, I want to stand up for people like my grandmother right you know people who haven't been very lucky but are decent people and need support right um so I think I, I had that sense but um I, th- I did have a sense as I was writing Chasing the Scream. I did think, you know, I had moments when I thought, am I really stupid that this is a revelation to me, right? Like, I thought, because once you hear Rat Park, for example, or you hear about Portugal, which we'll probably get to, once you know it, it's obvious, right? Again, it's not, but you have to know it, right? Um, and it has huge implications because let's say you believe the old story about addiction, that it's primarily or entirely caused by the chemical hooks, Right? If, and there's been a real resurgence of that story in relation to the opioid crisis, which perhaps we can talk about if you like. Um, there's been this real resurgence. The problem is caused by the drug, right? Now, there are some of the, there's certainly some problems that are caused by the drug. Chemical hooks are real. They're one part of a bigger picture. But if you believe that that's the whole of the story, the problem is the drug, well, then the war on drugs might, in some sense, make sense, right? I mean, to me, it's, a, it, it's got so many errors in it, not least because even if you thought all that was right, we haven't been able to get drugs out of our prisons and we've got walls around that the whole time. I mean, so even at the most elementary level, it's folly, right? But anyway, set that aside. You can see how, if the problem is the drug, you can see how that um, leads seemingly logically to a way of thinking that goes, right, well, we've got to get rid of the drugs, right? If that's the problem. But once you understand that drugs are an attempt to solve a problem. They're often not a good, a good solution, to be sure. Sometimes they're an absolutely catastrophic solution, as they've been in the case of some people I love. But they are an attempt to solve a problem. They're not the problem. 
Now, they, they can be a solution that makes the problem worse, as they are for some people. Of course, that's so obvious. It doesn't need to be said. But it's way too simplistic to think the drug is the problem. Think about the opioid crisis, right? There's been a real resurgence. I think a really disturbingly misguided narrative put about by well-intentioned people about the opioid crisis. So the story that is the dominant story that is being told about the opioid crisis, which until COVID-19 was one of the biggest killers, along with heart attacks and car accidents in the United States. Um, and COVID-19 has obviously overtaken all of them now, but, you know, uh, that won't last forever. Um, the, the, the story that's told is, okay, so you have these evil drug dealers who came along and they gave people this uniquely powerful drug and it hijacked people and it took them over and they died, right? Or they got into terrible trouble. And in this case, you know, that's what Nancy Reagan used to say with the Just Say No campaign, except this time in our new version of the story, the evil drug dealers are, you know, Purdue or whatever, rather than, you know, the stereotypical uh, drug dealer. Um, And it's not that there's no truth in that. The pharmaceutical companies are pieces of shit, the people who run them. I hope the people who run run Purdue and the the Sackler family and these other people go to prison for the rest of their lives. They deliberately missold these drugs. They... um, they lied about uh, the real risks that were involved in them, and there are real risks. Um, but I have to tell you, that is not the main reason why the opioid crisis happened. Where is the opioid crisis happening, right? It is happening in the places where there is most despair for perfectly understandable reasons. Very, people on the faculty of Harvard have much better access to opioid-based painkillers than people in West Virginia, because everyone on the faculty of Harvard's got really good medical insurance, and most people in West Virginia don't have good medical insurance. But there is almost nobody, I'm not saying nobody, there may be a few, but there's almost nobody on the faculty of Harvard dying of opioid overdoses, and there are epidemic levels in West Virginia, right? Yes. If it was about access to the drug and the drug taking you over, that would make no sense. It's primarily about the underlying despair. When a factory shuts down, opioid overdoses double in the following two years, right? That, that doesn't, there's a much more complicated thing going on and we've got to deal with the underlying despair. And there are places that have done that. I've been to them, Portugal, Switzerland, we can talk about that if you want. But the problem is, if we tell this very simplistic story about the opioid crisis, we can see what happens. Look what happened in Oklahoma. So we tell this simplistic story, the evil drug dealers can cause this, so what happens? You restrict the evil drug dealers. You reduce the amount of prescription opioids that people are given. What happened? Was there a sudden recovery from all these problems? No, of people just transferred to street heroin. Because the problem is the underlying despair, right? The primary problem, I'm not saying the only problem. The primary problem is that people don't want to be present in their lives because their lives are really painful. And they're not wrong to say their lives are really painful. It's not a delusion, right? Their lives are really painful. We've taken away from them the things that make life worth living. And we've got to rebuild that. And there are places that have done it. If you tell the wrong story about why a problem is happening, it's going to be very hard to get to a solution, right? Well, I think um, I never even understood what was going on in Portugal until I heard you speak about it. And again, like I'm like one of the least informed drug addicts in recovery who has a show about drug addiction and recovery, but it keeps me, it keeps me uh, pure, my, my lack of information and my lack of expertise. But when I was hearing you talk about Portugal, I knew that it, everything was decriminalized there. And, and, and as a drug addict, you, you think, oh, I should go then. You know what I mean? If everything is decriminalized, I have access. It becomes this fantasy as opposed to this solution or as opposed to like this good place for humanity. The drug addict thinks I can get dope there. The drug addict thinks, oh, I can get the, the dimorphine and shoot it for, for free in Switzerland. They don't think about the, the bigger implications of a better society. So when I started listening to you talk about the bigger implications of a better society, it really caught my ear because... Um, not only do they decriminalize all the drugs in Portugal, and, and, and I, you had said they're 15 years into this study in Portugal, into this arrangement. Why don't you explain the arrangement? Because I'm, I'm going to do a shitty job of, of explaining it. Compared so, to. so um, and obviously I spent a fair bit of time in Portugal to see how this works. So in the year 2000, Portugal had, obviously long before I went there, it had one of the worst drug problems in the world. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is staggering. And every year they tried the American way more. 
they arrested more people, they imprisoned more people. And every year the problem got worse until eventually the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together, the equivalent of Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi, or the Portuguese equivalents are very different. And they said, look, we can't go on like this. What are we going to do? And they decided to do something super radical, something no one had done since the drug war began 70 years before. They said, should we like ask some scientists what would be the best thing to do? So they set up a panel of scientists and doctors. It's like so funny that that's a mind-blowing idea. Like, like, let's, let's get an expert to study this and, and give us a good idea. Okay, continue, please. Madness, madness. madness. Yes. Uh, so they set up, they, they got this guy who I got to know later, a totally amazing man. You should talk to him on your podcast. He's such a great person. Dr. Juan Gulao. I apologize to anyone who speaks Portuguese. I cannot say Portuguese names. I just can't do it. Every time they say it to me, when I say it back, they're like, no. <laughs> but anyway, so Dr. Juan Gulao, and the panel was um, consisted of, uh, so Dr. Gulao had set up the first ever drug treatment center in Portugal when the dictatorship ended in the 70s. And the panel was um, social scientists, social workers, it was a judge, and doctors. And the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition said, you guys go away, look at all the best evidence, go anywhere you need to go, and we've agreed in advance we'll do whatever you recommend. So it just took it out of politics. So the panel goes to loads of different countries, they look at loads of evidence, they look at Rat Park, crucially, and they come back and they say, decriminalise all drugs, from cannabis to crack, everything. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on screwing people's lives up, on shaming them, punishing them, arresting them, all of that, and spend it all instead on turning their lives around. And interestingly, it wasn't really what we think of as drug treatment in the United States. So there's some residential rehab that has some value. Biggest thing they did was a massive program of meaning and job creation for people with addiction problems. They set up a huge program to give out small loans so people with addiction problems could set up and run small businesses about things they cared about. They set up a big program where, let's say you used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. The goal was to say to everyone with an addiction problem in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And we're going to try to help find your purpose. If you can't find it yourself, we're going to offer you, like, I mean, like, the thing that that blows me away about this, because obviously it seems so caring, so kind, it's what you want, like, you go to treatment, you want someone to help you find your purpose. It's all I ever wanted, you know. Um, Is it at all attempted to be replicated here or in England, this kind of a thing, to act, it's like me and Chris used to call it actualization of your life streams. You know what I mean? Like we, we always recommended that people, if they have an idea, do it. If you want to do a podcast, do it because you'll find those things, those great endorphins firing in your brain because you found something you love. Like, is it, is it at all being replicated here at all? Well, it can be if we fight for it. You know, uh, uh, partly we, we need to explain the results of what happened in Portugal. There was a 50% fall in injecting drug use. There was an 80% fall in overdose deaths. There was a massive fall in street crime, massive fall in HIV transmission. One of the ways you know it works so well is that virtually nobody in Portugal... It was super controversial at the time, as you can imagine. It still is, right? I mean, it still is. is. This is one of the things that's really striking. Almost nobody in Portugal wants to go back. They've got a big competitive political system. None of the political parties want to go back because... You can see the results, right? They still have problems in Portugal. It's not a magic bullet. But the problems fell so dramatic. You know, I went to interview a guy called Juan Figuera, who led the opposition to the decriminalization at the time. He was the top drug cop in Portugal. I think you say the Portuguese name is amazing, personally. <laughs> I but can't, yeah, but, yeah, but that's because you don't speak Portuguese, right? Maybe. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, you know, and, and, and Juan said to me, you know, he talked about, and don't forget this, he said, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. He said, you know, understandably, there'd be a massive explosion in addiction, there'd be a huge explosion in kids using drugs. He just said, none of that happened. The opposite happened. And he talked about how he felt really ashamed that he spent so many years arresting, 
harassing, imprisoning drug users when he could have been helping them turn their lives around. But in terms of, um, you know, whether this could happen in, in the US or in Britain, when I get disheartened about this, I always think about a friend of mine, um, a writer called Andrew Sullivan. So in 1994, it's the height of the AIDS crisis, the last pandemic. Um, and Andrew was diagnosed as HIV positive. He just watched his best friend Patrick die of AIDS. This is the height of death. There's no treatment in sight that anyone can see. So Andrew quit his job and he went to a little place in Cape Cod named Provincetown, basically to die. And he decided he was going to write a book about a crazy idea, a utopian idea. No one had ever written a book about this idea. And he was like, well, I'm never going to live to see this idea be put into practice, obviously. No one alive now will see it, but maybe someone, some way down the line will pick up this idea. The idea he wrote the first book to advocate ever was gay marriage. And when I try get disheartened, I try to imagine going back in time to 1994 and Andrew's little cottage in Provincetown, I say to him, okay, Andrew, you're not going to believe me, but 26 years from now, number one, you'll be alive. That would have seemed mind-blowing. Number two, you'll be married to a man. Number three, the Supreme Court of the United States will quote from this book you're writing now when they, can make it, when they make it mandatory for every state in the United States to introduce gay marriage. And I'll be with you when the next day the President of the United States invites you to have dinner with him at a White House lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag to celebrate what you and millions of other people have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that President, he's going to be black, Right. Every aspect of that would have sounded ludicrous. Impossible. Right? It'd be like me saying to you, so Chris, here's what's going to happen. So, so, so David, here's what's going to happen. Um, 26 years from now, a transgendered president is going to invite us to smoke crack with her in the Oval Office, right? It would be like, <laughs> my, yeah. not that we want that. I mean, the trans president, yes, the crack, no. Um, the, you know, it, it, the point, that didn't happen by magic, right? It happened... Because enough people gathered together, they fought for it, they appealed to other people to open their hearts, to change their minds. Enormous numbers of people changed their minds about gay people, right? It just enormous numbers in an incredibly short period of time. You have 2,000 years of gay people being persecuted, right? And then in the space of a century, you have this incredible... I mean, I'm 41, I'm gay. I didn't even hear the concept of gay marriage until I was 20, and I thought, well... That'll never fucking happen, right? right? So incredible transformations can happen when people band together and fight for them. They don't happen. The one guarantee is if we don't fight, as Elizabeth Warren always says, in politics, you don't get what you don't fight for, right? If we don't fight for it, well, we'll never get it. But it's absolutely achievable. And the one thing you can say in defense of the drug war, the war on drugs, is fuck me, the US has really given it a fair shot. The US has done it for 100 years, um, the U.S. has spent a trillion dollars on it. Um, the U.S. has imprisoned millions of its own citizens. It's killed hundreds of thousands of people. It's destroyed whole countries like Colombia and El Salvador. And at the end of that, you can't even keep pr- drugs out of your prisons where you pay guards to walk around the wall the whole time. That approach is never, ever going to work. In fact, it makes all the problems much worse. It's why the U.S. has one of the most intense drug wars in the world and some of the worst outcomes in terms of death and in terms of people with addiction problems having terrible lives, right? It's not a coincidence, right? The system destroys people. It makes their addictions worse. It spreads addiction. Um, But it doesn't have to be like that, right? People were hopeless in Portugal until they started to fight. People were hopeless in Switzerland until they started to fight. None of these things are fixed. None of them are ordained. They're they're entirely subject to ordinary people fighting back. But like, like it or not, you are an expert in this world, and, and you are renowned, even if you make fun of me for telling you that you're renowned. Um, when you talk to the addiction experts in the States, do you talk to people who own treatments? Do you talk to doctors, psychiatrists, these people who's, who are, you know, whose their career, their livelihood is helping addicts get better? Do you, do you talk to them? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a mixed bag, right? But does anybody ever say they want to try this? I mean, like, it just seems like such a radically perfect idea. Let's get the junkies to enjoy their life. Let's give the junkies some purpose. Let's root for them. You know what I mean? And it's like, 
Um, and I'm not hearing that in all of the, I mean, I've been to treatment a million times. I've been to public treatment. I've been to private treatment. I've been to outpatient. I've been to methadone. I've, I've done basically every kind of treatment there is. Um, and I never felt like anybody really wanted to help me find my purpose. It was never discussed. You know what I mean? So like, do you ever hear that kind of discussed when you talk to these people? Um, I think it's a few things. So it's worth saying there has been, even if you think about it at a really trivial level, right? Um, there's been, I'll give you a trivial example, but it's a profound change. There's been a deep change in how people with addiction problems are perceived in the United States in the last 30 years. So if you watch, even saying like, this is a dumb example, but watch Cagney and Lacey, right? Or those 80s cop shows. I know what you mean. Really often in a show like Cagney and Lacey, there will be a character who is an evil addict, right? Yeah. And you know they're evil because they're an addict, right? And that you're sh- they're shown as having no conscience, no feelings, they're terrible. The audience knows they're a bad person, right? You just know that from the minute they appear. You would never get that in any TV show now, right? It would be unthinkable there'd be a character in Law and Order who'd be like a kind of evil addict. And, it, and that's because there's been a deep change. It's just like there's no evil gay, you know, like if you look at films in the 70s, there are like evil gay, and of course there are gay people can be evil, I'm not disputing that, but like there are kind Same of... Same with addicts. Yeah. Exactly. There can even be evil gay addicts. That, that's <laughs> exactly. the thing too. Yeah. Let's yeah. not get carried away with madness here, but the, 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 you know, they're not evil by virtue of the fact they're gay right now, and they're not evil by virtue of the fact they're addicted. There's been a profound... You know, I go on Fox News pretty often and I say these things, and you know, Tucker Carlson, who's the most watched host on Fox, who I disagree with on most things, as I'm sure you can imagine is very supportive of these arguments. So there's been a really big change in, in attitudes towards people with addiction problems already, right? Now, the legal uh, infrastructure has not caught up with those changes in attitude. But most people, I think the figure in the most recent poll was 80% of people agree that the war on drugs has not worked, right? And most people are compassionate towards people with addiction problems. Even if you watch the Republican debates in the primaries last time, they all competed to say, you know, Carly Fiorina said my daughter died of addiction. Uh, Jeb Bush said, you know, a lot of them, I think it was Jeb Bush, I forget who, who, the exact people, but, you know, um, the, it, there was a competition to, sh- Chris Christie talked about his mother. Um, now, they don't back that with compassionate policies. I actually think Chris Christie is a disgusting and wicked person. I was on a panel with him. But, the, the, you know, even they have to, in their public presentation, talk in a compassionate way, right? So there's been a really, no one on that panel said, addicts are terrible people and we need to go after them and we need to arrest them and shame them, right? Which people did say publicly very recently in my lifetime, right? So I want to phrase this carefully. There are lots of really admirable people doing amazing work in the drug treatment sector in the United States. Uh, And I've met lots of them and I like and admire lots of them. There's also some people who... um, are very deeply invested in the status quo. We've got to be honest about that. And there's some people who have, whose model is based on, um, not based on, whose model contains a lot of internalized stigma and a lot of negative views. So, I mean, for example, this actually happened in Britain, but I've had similar experiences in the US. I was on a panel with a woman who runs a drug treatment center in Britain. I think actually a whole um, uh, whole series of drug treatment centres, if I remember rightly. And she had um, had a very chaotic, active heroin addiction 30 years before. And I was saying essentially what I've said to you. And she said, she was arguing against me and siding with a very right-wing politician on the panel who's in favour of punishing people with addiction problems. And she said, no, you don't, to me, she said, you don't understand, I was evil when I was using, right? And I just thought, and I tried to say to her, I'm so sorry you were made to feel that way. You weren't evil. You might have done bad things. By the way, lots of people without addiction problems do bad things, right? I've done bad things. Right. Done, all human beings do bad things sometimes. I hear you. How do you think things are going to change, though? So, you, so yeah, look, it's, it's, I don't think the pressure for change will come from people who make a lot of money in the existing system. Some of them will be really good and decent people who can see that there's a need for change, but, you know, some won't. The change will come 
just like the, the change in attitudes towards gay people didn't come from, you know, there were some gay organizations, but mostly it happened, you know, step by step, gay people bravely coming out, persuading the people around them, organizing at a local and national level for change. You know, it's a much more grassroots change than that. And I think the changes in addiction will be similar, right? But to do that, we need to have a movement of people who have addiction problems, people who've recovered from addiction problems, people who love people with addiction problems. Um, those kind of three, I think, will be the engines of it. Um, but we also, to do that, need to actually challenge the stigma that is in a lot of people who've got addiction problems, right? right. They, they think it's their own fault. They think they deserve to be punished. They think, you know, and when you're challenging a stigma, you know, think about, because I'm gay, I think I can say this in a way that won't be misunderstood. A lot of gay men will say things like, will, will um, uh, diss effeminate gay men. They go, I'm, not, I'm not really gay or something like that. Well, he, they're the faggot, not right, me. Right, right, right? right? So you can see when there's a stigma, um, you can challenge it in one of two ways. You can say, well, the stigma is essentially true, but I'm not the right target, right? Or you can say the stigma is wrong and we need to dismantle the stigma itself. So homophobia, you can say, actually, there's nothing wrong with being gay. It's a perfectly healthy, consensual thing that's always existed and always will. Or you can say yeah, there is something bad about faggots, but I'm not the faggot. Look at this effeminate person over here. Chris Rock has a famous routine about, you know, I'm not the N-word, they're the N-word. It's a similar thing, right? Yeah. Um, um, So it's easier to go, like this woman I was on a panel with, yeah, addicts are evil, I used to be evil, but look, now I'm the good person aligning with the right-wing politician. Um, I'm the good person, I'm not evil now, right? Rather than go, it's insane to think people with addiction problems are evil, right? It's madness, it's a form of lunacy. You know, they're in deep pain, they need more love, not less love. And, you know, so I think you have to... um, You have to challenge the stigma, you know, at its very base, at the heart of it. And we need to organise and demand it. And there's loads of great groups that are doing that. I would recommend people join the Drug Policy Alliance. I recommend people form groups of their own to fight for these changes. You should, you should join the Dopey Nation because the Dopey Nation is all about this stuff. It's uh, anti-stigma, anti-shame. It's, it's meeting people where they are. It's like I, I had a buddy who used to always, in, in the, along these lines, he would be like, I was never as bad a junkie as you are to me, he would say. Because he, he sniffed dope and I would shoot it and he'd be like, oh, well, you're a real junkie junkie and i'm i just you know mess around sometimes and he of course wound up dying you know he's one of my best friends and he wound up dying and to his death he was always saying that he wasn't as bad as x y or z and that's not the language that gets anybody better i totally get what you're saying and i totally appreciate you coming on our little show it's been such a pleasure having you on you're such a cool storyteller and i i love uh what you've done and I think, uh, I think it's really going to have a really beautiful impact on our audience. So thank oh, you. Thank you. I should say, because my publishers always... Wait, what do they do? They give me this like ridiculous fucking script to read out, which I, ne- I can't do because it makes do me it. sound like... Read the such, script. Make them no, no, I can't. It makes me sound like such a prick. It go like, if you want to see what Hillary Clinton and Elton John and, other, and Oprah said about this, but, but I can't do that. It makes me like, I can't. Um, the, sorry, I have to be careful about the C word because it has a very different meaning in Britain to the U.S., no, we like the word cunt. We like yeah. the word cunt. My mother cunt, uses it. My, my mother is Scottish because it's not like a gendered thing. So if you said to my mother, how do you get to Times Square? Right, she'd go, well, walk down the road, go right, you'll see a bunch of cunts standing there, go left where they are, walk down, you'll see another bunch of cunts, that's, that's Times Square. So it's no, like, insult to them. So my parents both use that word constantly. When my niece was six, I took her to McDonald's. She, my parents had been looking after her. And uh, she had a Happy Meal. And she said, Johan, can I have another Happy Meal? And I said, oh, Aaron, you can't have two. It's not good for you. And realized she said, Johan, don't be such a cunt. <laughs> and I said, Erin, you can't use that word. She said, you are a cunt. You're a cunt. <laughs> Just screaming at her. Anyway, um, so if you want to know more about... Um, well, the most important thing is that people are stuck at home at the moment. You can listen to audio of loads of the interviews for free of loads of the people we've been talking about, people in Cotty in Germany and uh, Bruce Alexander who did Rat Park, loads of people. So if you go to, for the one that's about addiction, it's www.chasingthescreen.com. You can see where to get the book or the audio book or the e-book. Um, 
and if you what about depression and some of the things we've been talking about as well it's thelostconnections.com and you can get the book audio book or ebook there as well but like i say there's you can listen to loads of audio you can take a quiz to see how much you know about the real causes of addiction depression um and you can see where to follow me on social media on twitter instagram facebook but you know i did an interview recently where someone said to me at the end they're like what's your twitter what's your facebook and they said what's your tiktok and snapchat and i was like I am a 41-year-old man, right? The only 41-year-old men on Snapchat are certainly pedophiles. So I was like, the, the... My daughter begs me to do TikTok. She begs me to do it. And I, I, I don't even understand how to do it, but I want, I'm ready to do it. I want to do it. I think you should do it too. a child and helping a child navigate it. That is the <laughs> one okay. justification for anyone over the age of, I would say, 27 joining TikTok. You should do it with Aaron. You should have some Happy Meals and do some TikTok with Aaron. Oh, no? she's she she showed it to me, and uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there with her. Many wow. things I would do for my niece, but I'm not going to TikTok. Thank you a billion times. You've given us so much time. You've been so generous, and uh, it was really cool. So I'm coming to New York. I'm meant to be there now, but obviously because of the plague, I'm not there. Next time I come to New York, will you give me something free in Katz's Deli? I will give you something free in Katz's Deli. Ah! I, will, I will take you to lunch, but maybe Amazing. we'll do another. We'll do another dopey in person, and we can take questions from the audience. And I'll reenact the famous Meg Ryan Katz's Deli. Well, just give me anything, not, and I'll start orgasming. It'll be amazing. That's I, I want to sit in the exact chair that Meg Ryan sat in. I have you look a bit like Billy Crystal as well. So. That's the worst thing I've heard all day. I have to say <laughs> that's 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 the biggest. In, I'm taking that part out of the, the thing. <laughs> One more time, thank you so much for coming on. You were fucking awesome. All right, um, thank you so much. We never have people like uh, Johan Hari on the show, so I'm very very uh, grateful that he decided to make time for it. I know Chris would have loved that, um, and that addiction is the opposite of connection. Phrase is just always floating around. And it was funny, the other day I looked at the Dopey Nation and someone had posted that quote, and they didn't know that Johan Hari was going to be the guest this week. It was Erin. She didn't know. And that's the synchronistic, the synchronous power that is Dopey. The Dopey podcast, always one step ahead of itself, like the snake eating its own tail. And what do we call the snake eating its own tail? I believe it's called Uroboros. I think that's what it's called. Is it called Uroboros? I don't know. If you guys know, send in an email to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. I want to make this an all English episode, and I have the, the means to do it by playing a story from one of my favorite dopey storytellers who happens to also be English. His name is Mike. He calls himself Mick. Straight out of New Zealand. Here he is, Mick or Mike. Hello, Dave. Hello, Dopey Nation. It's uh, Mick here. I hope everybody is happy and well. I was talking to a mate of mine the other day on the phone. I haven't spoken to him in many years, and he reminded me of uh, this awesome dopey story from many years ago. Um, I was actually I was going to tell it on the dopey Zoom, the Saturday meetings, the dopey confessional meetings. But I've been naughty. I've I've had a funny few weeks, and I haven't. Um, I haven't been in touch with anyone online and I feel a bit bad about that because I really should have been sensible and, uh, you know, reached out to people rather than uh, hiding away, but I didn't. So, anyways, um, here's a great dopey story from many moons ago back uh, back in London. I, um, I used to have a little window cleaning maintenance company that I sort of had with a mate of mine. Um, uh, but we were dealing drugs on the side. Well, actually, we were dealing drugs and we had a maintenance company on the side. It was more the point. Um, we used to... Uh, we had a sign written van, you know, transit van and um, high-vis jackets and all the gear, and we genuinely did. We cleaned people's windows and did little carpentry jobs and stuff, but it was a great cover for dealing drugs because you can park a white transit van if you're wearing a high-vis anywhere in London and Kent, and no one really second-guesses you, so... It was great. <clears throat> anyway, I was uh, travelling up to London on the train. I wasn't in the van. He was working. I was going up. Um, we were living in Kent at the time. I was travelling up about half hour on the train. Um, and I was buying drugs from some Jamaican boys I knew up where I used to live in the city. 
and then coming back down and um, we were selling them in um, in this little town in, in, in Kent As I see it on the news these days in the UK it's all this stuff in the news about like, as if it's as if it's something new this county lines drug dealing you know people from the inner cities corrupting suburbia with their narcotics well fuck me it's not news you know we was doing it 20 years ago but not that I'm proud of that but fuck anyway um, that's what we was doing so I was travelling up town and I was buying anywhere from an ounce to half a bar of 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 each of, of smack and crack and um then coming back and splitting that up into grams or tenths or eighths and selling it to sort of like your junkie halfway, you know, man drug dealers who just sort of supported their own habit, which was what I was doing as well. I was just dealing in slightly larger amounts, but I had a few sort of end end customer junkies I'd sort of dealt to but I tried to avoid that sort of thing because you're more likely to get caught and because we had the business going we had a little bit of money as you know we could buy a slightly larger amount so that's what we do anyway so I'm on the train and um uh, we've, we've been doing this for a little while and um along with many other people no doubt um I'm on the train and 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 I'm getting a bit worried I'm coming back and I <laughs> this um I see this guy watching me, and he's wearing a hoodie and um, and jeans. And I, I sort of used to get up and move every sort of ten, fifteen minutes. Look out the toilet or something, and move carriage. So if, you know you're being watched. You know you can. You know you get, you get an idea. And this geezer followed me, and I saw him. The shiny shoes. He's wearing jeans and a hoodie, but then the fucking shiny shoes. I'm half oh, for fuck's sake. Here we go. So I sit down near the doors. Um, and we pulled the train pulled into Orpington Station, and I waited for the doors to open. And then, just as it went beep 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 for the doors to close, I just fucking bolted and I jumped up and I ran out the doors as they were closing. And he jumps up and I'm like fuck fuck fuck, and the door catches me arm. And it's you know the, the rubber seals on the inside edge of each door. They close, they clamp together, and it gets me like between my wrist and my elbow. And I'm like, oh no, fuck, fuck! So I, I rip it out, and it friction burns the skin off my arm. And I just see the cop on the inside. He whacks the emergency stop button on the train, which is the alarm button, and I just fucking book it, bolt it up the platform up the steps through the ticket office and just like long jump vault over the the ticket styles and the geezers yelling at me and I'm fucking out the front of the station past the taxi rank down the road and down the bottom of the road there's a little dairy 7-Eleven thing on the bottom and out the front of it there's these two newspaper bins which have the London Light the London Metro free newspaper and there's about a four inch gap between the back of these big metal newspaper bins and the and a brick wall in the corner so I've got my while I've been running I've like pulled my parcel of gear out and I lob it surreptitiously well I've surreptitiously fucking hell about as subtle as that sort of thing ever is down this gap down the back of the bins and I can hear the footprints of the copper behind me but it's sort of around a corner so he maybe oh fuck maybe he didn't see me lob it I carry on around the corner under the railway bridge and up a residential side road and um I could still hear him behind me up until about 30 seconds before you know running 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 um and I run round this sort of corner. I know it's a bit of a blind spot for him if he's still behind me. I wasn't even sure. And I dive over this wall into a into a front, it's like this front garden of a house. And there's a big rhododendron and a laurel bush there, big bush. So I would like hide in that between the wall and which is straight onto the footpath and um, under this bush in this lady's front. Well, I didn't know it was a lady at the time, but this lady's front garden. And I'm just hiding there. And I didn't hear any footprints run past, but, um, but about ten minutes later, I, um, I could, I could, I, I stuck my head and I could sort of peep out, and I saw a cop car drive up the road uh, slowly. So they'd obviously, yeah, called, and they were, they, this was at a time when they were trying to crack down on 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 that sort of thing. I remember there were dog dog units at every station for a while, and 
blah 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 anyway it's the middle of winter I'm not really dressed for it you know I've just got like a light cardigan and a t-shirt on I'm freezing my fucking bollocks off and um, I was there for a couple of hours and it's mid evening by oh early evening by this point it's getting dark I don't want to get out because I need to get back to the station um, I've got my phone on silent I text my mate and told him the situation and said if you like, can you come and pick me up but you gotta wait until I sort of give you a time and a place anyway about 20 minutes later I'm just getting ready to move and the, and the lights come on outside this house and I hear this voice are you alright dear I said I, oh, I turn around and there's this little dear old lady standing there and she's obviously really nervous she's seen me because my feet were sticking out the other side of this bush and I said oh I made out that I was home <laughs> I, made, I felt so I was just terrible I made out that I was homeless and that I'd fallen asleep because I'd been out on the streets for days with no sleep and I'd, I'd looked for shelter and this was the first place I'd seen um, and she was obviously worried <laughs> she's just one of these really good people so so I said look love I'm 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 sorry I didn't realise this was private property or, or some bollocks and I got up and um and off I went um but my mate picked me out around the corner and about a month after this everything came to a head for me and I didn't get arrested but I went to re I went to detox and rehab and I got clean and I, I didn't stay clean but I was clean for a few months and, and and I went back to her house with my business van and um I knocked on her door and and she didn't recognize me and I told her that we were doing complimentary cleans for senior citizens so I went round I cleaned all her windows I cleaned all the leaves out of all her gutters I fixed up um a door a wobbly door frame a wobbly bloody she she had a door to her um her garage sort of thing outhouse thing was missing a hinge and it was all wonky I fixed that up for her um and I did a couple of other bits for her and I didn't charge her and that was my my spiritual dollars Uh, and I wish I could have said I sort of carried on that run of good behavior but I didn't I am I relapsed not long after it and that was ended up what ended up leading to um the the next detox I would anyway yeah which is a story I told I think on here before when I did the rapid opiate detox but anyway it was one of those funny full circle stories and it was one I probably should have told ages ago because it was a great story and I'd, I'd forgotten about it until the other day but anyway there's a dopey story Dave I love you mate please always as I always say keep doing what you're doing loving the show it's 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 always good it never disappoints um, I hope everyone out there is happy and well and um, weathering the storm that is the fucking fucked up world we live in at the moment. Um, so, yeah, stay strong, Dobie Nation, and fucking toodles for Chris. Oh, Mike, thank you for the story. I love hearing from you. I hope you're doing well. Um, anybody in the Dopey Nation with a funny, harrowing, debaucherous drug story, Keep it short, keep it dopey, keep it funny. Record it on your phone and send it to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. We need dopey voicemails always. And before we go, I just want to remind you guys uh, to make dopey successful. You need to subscribe to it on iTunes. You need to leave a five-star review, make it good, and maybe my father will read it. We are going to call my father now and have him read another glowing five-star review, hopefully. Hold on. So, Dad, I have my father on the phone. So, Dad, I was just telling the audience that if they write a review, there's a chance that you will read it on the show. This is this is my new plan to make the show bigger is to get people to, su- to subscribe to the show and leave more reviews. And I know you're obsessed with the reviews and the rankings, correct? Oh, you've been improving a great deal, though. How do you're you figure? You're NPR now. In, sure. in what? On the, on the listing on the drug recovery, NPR was number one because they were talking about the COVID-19, but now you're ahead of them. Um, so I think that back to normal where Dopey is the top one in the uh, drug recovery. You're also the top one in drug comedy. 
Well, I think I'm the uh, only one. Is, I think we're the only one in drug comedy. And this about, this you're week the only one in drug comedy, right? This weekend yeah. is Father's Day, and my dad is yeah. depressed. You're depressed, right, Dad? Um, well, I don't want to use the word depressed because I can get pretty happy pretty fast, and I don't get so unhappy. But I, I really think need to have more people. Uh, it, this this COVID business is. Is not good for me, but I, I'm going to get outside. I'm up upstate, so I can get outside much easier than in Manhattan and uh, and get exercise. I've been keeping my weight down, which is great. You sound so, you sound but, miserable. You got to do something, what? Dad. You got to get back out and golf. You got you got to go buy a laptop. You got to you got to get back to your online dating. You got to do something. Cook something. You got to slap yourself in the face and get out there, man. I know. I agree. I agree. I'm 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 ready to do that. I I think I almost figured out I get this uh, printer to work, but um, but uh, I think I'm giving up on one of the computers, which means that it was, it's probably too old to connect. Anyway, what do you want me to read here? Do you want me to read something? Read the review. The review I sent you. Well, you have about three of them in a row. Do you want me to start on the top, which it says five stars? Don't be set the bar. That's the one. Okay. All right, don't be set to the bar by Wait, dad, 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 dad. Just can you read it like you actually care about it? For for a teacher, you might be the worst outline out loud reader I ever heard. Read it like you care. Show some show some chutzpah. Uh, time out. You know that I'm the one in the dopey nation that cares the most about the review. So of course I care. I'll try to I try to read it with. It's in uh, a five star review by Unstable Genius. I have found a few podcasts that follow the dopey format that are really pretty good, but it's kind of like smoking tar when dopey is like slamming some fine china white. Alan, you know what I mean. What do you Um, think, Dad? Do you you know what he means when he says that the dopey imitators are like smoking some shitty tar where dopey is like slamming some fire china white? Can you relate to that expression, Dad? What do you think he means? well, I think I know what it means. Uh, it's, I think they're talking about the the quality of heroin. Is that true, David? Yes, Dad. You you really are. You, you never cease to amaze me. Your powers of intuition uh, and reading between the lines are off the charts, Dad. Um, I think you should take the kayak out on the lake. Maybe you should jump in the lake. You should you should do something. But that was what the me the most was the kayak. I used the kayak ramp and it actually worked. And then when I came back onto the ramp, it was so hard to get the kayak that I was really upset. So you're saying that, <laughs> that you're lucky. That made me feel bad. At your, at your, it was easy to get in and very hard to get out. Well, maybe you, you should do is you should get out in the water. Get out in the water. Yeah, I think I will. I think I will. I'll have to pull some weed. You must be very right, wealthy. Are we going to put Susie to sleep now? What's happening? Dad, you must be very wealthy to be at your own lake house with your kayak ramp and kayak. It sounds like you're living it up out there. I, it, it's very hard to hear what you said. You said something about being very wealthy. Is that what you're trying to say? Is that it? It sounds like you're very wealthy out there with your fancy kayak lake house and fancy new kayak ramp. Fancy kayak ramp is a dock that is submerged in water that ice has completely smashed the dock. So this is not fancy. It's broken. That's what it is. But it turns out that the kayak can get on and off of it pretty easy. But fancy is not the word. Broken is the word. Do you have any, do you have any criticisms from last week's show that you were not in, that you were absent from? No, I, I don't have any criticism when I'm absent from a show. No, that, that's, that's not anything. I, actually, I thought it was very good. I thought it was a really very good show. I think you're doing great. I think you need to find some better material, Dad. I need, I need you to be unhappy with the show. Um, but it's Father's Day. I will see you on Sunday. Have a beautiful day at the lake. Uh, are you leaving today? Uh, no, I'm going to leave tomorrow. Well, make today a good day. Go to Vermont, maybe buy some pottery, do it up. Well, <laughs> yeah, all right. Maybe, maybe I'll go to the, to the golf course and get more frustration. But in, in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, all right, I will see you on, on, on Sunday. And I, in the Dopey Nation, please stay healthy out there, uh, everybody. And hopefully things are going to get better. That's what we're hoping for. So thanks, Dad. It's another great week of Dopey. 
Thank you to everybody in the Dopey Nation for all that you do, especially Craft Master General Misty Janney, who's just constantly working her butt off for Dopey. God bless you. Um, before we go, um, I want to leave you guys with the version of Good So Bad that was on the last Patreon episode. Everyone wanted to know who it was from. It's from a woman who doesn't want me to say her name. She just wants me to call her Kat. And Kat sent in the email to Chris and I on May 21st, 2017, and she wrote, Just call me Kat. Awesome show, guys. When you do something different and brave, people listen. Love the stories, and I'm always inspired by how hard addicts fight to overcome addiction. I started listening after I developed a fascination with addiction. You see, my family has alcoholism in it. My grandpa was in AA for decades. My dad and aunt also struggle with drinking. And sometimes the way booze makes me feel, uh, it makes me nervous that with a twist of fate, I may somehow, someday, have to battle these demons myself. I know this is super random, but I like listening to your show uh, to keep me from going down that road. It reminds me that it does exist and always to watch my drinking choices. It also inspires me to see how far people can come if they fight for what they want. Anyways, that's my story. Also, Dave, your songs are really cool. I covered Good So Bad. Here is an iPhone recording. Hope you dig, Cat. So thanks, Cat. Stay strong, Dopey Nation, and fucking toodles for Chris. Wanna take a walk around the world I wonder would it do me any good Until I get some money in my pocket Then I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood Cause I wanna be so good, so Wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I wanna be so good, so bad But bad desire is all I've ever had I I wanna take a ride up in the sky So bad Wanna be so good So bad So bad Wanna be so good So bad This is the Dopey Podcast.